Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I'm here today with Uma. Uma is a writer, literary translator, and film enthusiast with a keen interest in the linguistic traditions of South Asia, especially in her mother tongue, Marathi. Thank you so much for joining me today, Uma. How are you? Hi, Elle. It's so great to be here. I'm so happy that you invited me to be on this podcast. And I think it's something great that you're doing. And I really look forward to our conversation. Oh, I do too. Because this is the first episode where we're talking about Marathi. And I have so much to learn from you and so much to learn about your work and about literary traditions and film. And I'm so excited to talk to you today. Oh, I'm excited too, because it's a topic that's very close to my heart. So I can't wait. Yeah, amazing. I like to start each episode with the same question. And that is, what is your first language and which languages have you learned to speak? My first language is Mar- Marathi, which is my mother tongue. And uh, the other languages I know are in English, of course. I've had an English medium education. So in metropolitan cities, uh, so I've been brought and brought up in Mumbai, of course, that's a metropolis. And so I've had an English education in there. I know Gujarati as well. I believe uh, you've had uh, two uh, guests on the show in Guj- Gujarati as well. I lived in an area, uh, no, not area, I'd say, I lived in a neighborhood in Mumbai where it was a melting pot. So there were other Maharashtrians, there were uh, people who spoke Guj- Gujarati. My friends in school were, um, there was a majority of Gujarati speaking um, friends. So I've picked up Gujarati from a young age and I taught myself how to read the language as well. So I used to read the signboards on the shops and uh, <laughs> and so Gujarati and uh, Hindi, of course. So Hindi, I learned it in school. So English, Hindi and Marathi were taught in school, of course, and okay. Gujarati I picked up on my own. Yeah, these are the languages that I know and that I can speak to a great extent. I mean, English, Hindi, Marathi, of course, I'm fluent, but Gujarati is at an intermediate level of fluency yet. Okay. So, I just like to add one thing that uh, most South Asians are generally either bilingual or trilingual. Yeah. So we grow up uh, in our mother language and then we speak English as well. And uh, then there's either Hindi or any other language that you may pick up. So at any given point of time, you will have people speaking two, three, four, five, six. It just goes on goes on and on, depending on the provenance of the person. Yeah. So yes, these are the languages. I love that so much about India. And I think that is just such a beautiful part of, I would imagine, Indian life and Indian culture. Because I think here... And probably in Europe, people put so much emphasis on studying different languages and, you know, gaining fluency, quote unquote, in different languages. But I always like to say that there are people around the world who are living in multiple languages every single day because it's normal. It's just what you do. And it's there's nothing that is extraordinary necessarily about it. It's just, hey, there's you know, so-and-so and and he can communicate with this person and it's just a part of life. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Oh, it definitely is because I personally maintain that the more languages, the more songs you have to cry to. You have that many number of songs you can listen to and cry. (laughs) Oh my my God. (laughs) No, I'm aware that sounds a little dark, but yeah. You know what? It's like, well, we all have to cry, whether it's dark or not, you know, whether it's happy tears or sad tears, like we all we all have to cry. But I, you know why I love that? Because let's say you're going through a heartbreak or a particular something that's sad. And there have been times in other languages where I've heard a sentiment that I would never, ever even think of to exclaim in English. But in this other language, it just fits so perfectly and it just gets me. And I, oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that. Like, I love, <laughs> I love that. I love that so much. And it's a hundred percent true. In Mumbai, is you said you grew up in our multicultural, multilingual part of the city. Is that common? Is it typical where there are you know, people who are multilingual all in one area or um, are people typically, you know, speakers of one or, 
you know, come from a certain part of, of India in one place and then people from another place or like, how does that mixing typically occur? So uh, I'll tell you when it comes to Mumbai. Uh, so Mumbai is, of course, uh, it's the financial capital of Maharashtra, which is the largest state in India. And uh, there's a lot going on in Mumbai. The entertainment industry is here. There is a lot going on because uh, it's the seat of power here, which is apart from Delhi, which is the national capital. So Mumbai has traditionally always been a melting pot and you have a lot of people from different places in India who are coming and settling here. So that gives rise to a whole multicultural, multilingual environment, at least in Mumbai. And within the city as well, you will have certain pockets, certain enclaves, which will have, uh, not all of them, of course, but there are certain places with a more concentration of Marathi speakers or Gujarati speakers. Or or, uh, there are some areas where you will have a a lot of Tamil speakers. So that's how it functions in Mumbai. For the rest of India, of course, every state has their uh, local uh, language. India has about, uh, not about, India has 22 official languages currently as part of the 8th schedule of the constitution. These are just official. There are so many more uh, regional variants and dialects. And so that's the beauty of it all. There is... There isn't one language for one one place. It is just constantly mixing and it's a whole. There is a lot of uh, give and take that's happening because languages uh, influence each other. And you can see near the borders, if you have the Marathi speaking near the borders of this, the state will have influence from the languages of those, those, those states and so on and so forth. That's how it is here. There's a very... Beautiful proverb in Hindi which says kos kos par badle bani char sorry kos kos par badle pani char kos pe bani. So it says says that so one kos is about 1.2 miles. So it says that the taste of the water changes every 1.2 miles and every 4.8 miles the language will change. So but there's a lot of variety there. <laughs> I wouldn't say varieties. It's just, it's a beautiful diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I can't wait to visit someday. Let's talk about Marathi. Now, I want my listeners to know how we got here and how we we got to having this conversation. I saw (laughs) that you posted that you felt like many people did not realize that Marathi is a language. And I instantly was like, of course, it's a language. Like, I know it's a language. Why don't people know this so where did that come from and where what led you to posting that you felt that way it was a combination of many things actually uh so firstly is that uh, since i'm a literary translator in india uh, marathi is uh, traditionally been an underrepresented language in the translation pyramid so what happens in the indian subcontinent is that there are certain languages that get translated much more than the others now, uh, there is obviously a lot of factors at play here. I'm not getting into that right now because that will be like a whole, uh, the, the whole other conversation about translation. But uh, there are certain languages which are translated more than the others and Marathi doesn't quite fit into that. And of course, as a native speaker, I will of course be very proud of my language, my culture. And I'd like to make as many people aware about it as I can, which is why uh, my page uh, so my Instagram page was uh, originally started just for translating lyrics, but then I slowly started uh, focusing on Marathi. I do have a lot of other languages, but I try to post as much as I can about Marathi songs, Marathi languages, culture, all these things. That's where my Marathi comes from. And since I translate from Marathi into English, I, I can see the the dearth of, trans- of uh, tra- translators of published titles. So sometimes it just really pains you. Mm. Because it's your own language and you don't see it anywhere. It's just that the representation is not as much as it should be. It's definitely there, but not as much. And uh, then also, I happened to chance upon, uh, there was an author, I won't take names now, but there was an author who is, uh, uh, he tweeted that I got an offer for my book to be translated into Marathi. And I thought it is an obscure Indian dialect. And then... uh, and then he realized that he he later goes on to say that no, it has about ninety million speakers worldwide and is the tenth most spoken language in the world. So there are of of course very appreciative comments below that tweet, but then it's just is that why would you think something is an obscure Indian dialect? Mm-hmm. I just I just fail to understand that bit of it. That's why uh, 
I it was very honestly it was a just it was a knee jerk reaction. But then I didn't know that it would resonate with you or with my other readers so much. So that's why that post. It definitely resonated with me as as someone living in in the United States because I think that it's very easy for someone who's not worldly and someone who doesn't seek what what's out there to think India and then okay what language do they speak Hindi and it's like Hindi is a piece of the puzzle and I feel like a lot of people probably wouldn't even think of you know the tw- maybe 21 other you know official languages that are spoken in India and not realize that with these languages come different cultures, come different literatures, different, like, for example, and I I always say this, I'm learning too, as I'm doing this. And obviously I knew Marathi is a language, but you know, one thing I did not know, I did not know that there was um, cinema that wasn't just in Hindi. Like, I didn't know that there were movie productions done in other in other states in India, in other languages in India. I learned that from like doing this show because from here where I sit and what we, what I see that we get in the U S is Bollywood. And of all the Bollywood movies I've seen, they've all been in Hindi. So for me, just being like, Oh, okay. There's, there's an industry that is in other language. Like I learned that and I was like, I was so happy to learn that. And now I'm like, I want to see, <laughs> I want to see movies in, in other Indian languages that, that show off other parts of the culture because I'm only getting one side of the narrative. So I'm really glad that your knee jerk reaction resonated with people because I think, and I hope that it, it opened people's eyes to how much more that India has to offer and how much more there there actually is in India. Uh, definitely. And I'll just like to uh, tell you something interesting that the word Bollywood is a portmanteau of the words Bombay and Hollywood because that's where uh, that's where our film industry is. Most of the Hindi films are uh, made in this city. So that's where the word Bollywood comes from. And if something is Bollywood, it's, 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 it's going to be Hindi. There is no other... Uh, language yes i mean of, of course i mean uh, i would definitely love to talk to you more about films whenever we we get to that point in the conversation today definitely i'll be taking notes throughout so that i can <laughs> <laughs> so that so that i can take your recommendations but for now tell me what you know about marathi about you know how we're using the language um tell me any things about the language that you um, that you love or you find interesting? What are some quirks of Marathi that that delight you? How do we form sentences and things like that? So I'll just start by uh, giving you a very small introduction. I'll try not to make it very bookish or like I'm reading from a PPT or something. <laughs> I won't do that. So uh, Marathi is uh, the fourth largest spoken language in India. And of course, it's among the 22 official uh, languages. There are about uh, 75, 80, 90 million speakers worldwide. This number is disputed because uh, Indian linguists uh, say one thing and then there is, of, of course, a lot of information floating around on the net. But I'd say between 80 to 90 million speakers worldwide, making it the 10th slash 15th most spoken language worldwide. It originated sometime in the 5th century AD. And uh, it evolved in the 7th century. From about the 9th century, uh, it started com- being coming into use as spoken languages. And that's how the dialects also evolved from there. So uh, since Maharashtra shares a border, presently Maharashtra shares a border with about six different Indian states, uh, three in the north and three in the south. So linguistically, if you see, there's a bridge between the languages of, of the north and the south because Maharashtra is right in the middle. It's in the West, but it's definitely, there's a, there's a kind of a bridge that's happening. So um, that's where the language comes from. And uh, it has a very old literary tra- tradition from about either the 10th or the 11th century a- a- AD is when the uh, last recorded piece of, not last, sorry, the first recorded piece of literature was there in Marathi. The last I checked, there are about, the languages of Maharashtra are about 50 documented. There are definitely many more because there are some which are dying out. I'm not sure of the names yet, 
but uh, this is how the language usually is i grew up speaking the language at home as do all uh, marathi uh, children and uh, we of course learned it in school as well but the thing is uh, since english take english takes precedence over that i kind of lost touch with the language uh, throughout my um, formative years and not formative years throughout my uh, higher education mm-hmm. and then after i started my instagram page is when i reconnected with my roots with language because the post that you see so there are all the research and translation is done by me of course so i needed to obviously do the research to write the captions and figure the meanings of words so that the translation is accurate so that's how i got into rediscovering the language and then i started reading the literature as well because i read some of it in school some of it as supplementary reading i hadn't studied the language academically as in there was no uh, university degree that i have mm. in this language with this language as a subject so that's why it became all the more important for me to get back and just catch up on what what i've been missing out on that's the thing that sounds very exciting that you had that opportunity to rediscover your language and re- and then not only re you know rediscover it and bring it back into your life but use it in such a powerful way to share it with people and like how does that feel to you know have that ability to be able to do that oh it feels great uh, honestly i think more than my ability no one's ability but more than the bharati language i'm just happy that i can translate because that is a bridge to bringing languages from one culture to into another that's what i feel and i'm trying to do a little bit of that at least i think i'm trying trying to <laughs> i hope that i have succeeded so far yeah so yeah that's how marathi is there and one more thing that's something's very interesting is that uh, marathi has a lot of influence from persian mm-hmm. which is a fact that not many people know <laughs> and again uh, coming back to my point about how languages evolve over time with influence from other la- languages so in the medieval era that is uh, 14th or 15th century so uh, you had the maratha empire in maharashtra and parts of uh, it was the entire deccan plateau that was ruled by the maratha emperors and uh, there was also the deccan sultanates so these were uh, sultans and there were five different sultanates i'm not getting into the d- details now but their uh, the language is used there in, in in the court was persian that of course uh, influenced marathi language and the result is that today a lot of i think at least 20 or 30% of the vocabulary in my marathi is influenced from persian because there are some very 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 similar words yeah how interesting do you have any examples of that Oh yes so darwaza the darwaza in marathi so the th- so what usually happens is is that the general structure of the word is retained it's just that a few sounds are uh, they just go here 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 and there so darwaza in marathi is darwaza in farsi that is persian mm-hmm. then you have uh, kurchi which is chair and that in persian is kursi or so you have so on and so so forth and uh, these words have become part of everyday conversations and not conversation not conversation let's say but they have been they're a part of modern voc- vocabulary now mm-hmm. so one more word i can tell you is nest nest na but which means to vanquish or annihilate and it comes from nest or nabud which oh. is which is to this completely destroy someone so right. this is how the language has been influenced and this is something very interesting that not many people know about so i always make it a point to include this fact that yeah. it's influenced from from persian yeah that's amazing i love that i love what language can do i love how it can evolve and be influenced by by others i think it's such a beautiful yes. thing <laughs> tell me about marathi you know and especially in mumbai which is so multilingual, so multicultural. People who are speaking uh Marathi, you, your friends, your family, whoever, how do we mix languages together? Oh, uh, that's a very interesting question L because uh, even I'm just thinking. So, uh in Mumbai usually uh so I'll, I'll just tell you what happens in Mumbai. So, 
since like i said since it's a melting pot there is a lot of influence happening the hindi that's spoken in mumbai sounds strange because it's translated from marathi really yes so <laughs> the syntax is marathi but it's into hindi so that's why the hindi spoken in mumbai is a little it's a little different than the standard register so uh, <laughs> yeah oh you have to give me an example like how <laughs> how are <we? laughs> Okay, so I'll give an example. When um, so Hindi to me for for me is मुझे मुझे so and so चाहिए so I want so and so मुझे चचा चाहिए so मुझे is standard Hindi और मुझको but the Hindi spoken in Mumbai we'll say मेरे को hmm. which means again it is translated from Marathi mala that la is an indicator to me. I see. So, like this, you'll have a lot of uh, direct. I mean, you'll have a lot of direct translations like this. Now, since I'm a native speaker of the language, I can figure out if there's a word in translation. I mean, I I can make that connection. But uh, to explain it to other people is uh, where I tell them that it's translation from Marathi. That's why the Hindi sounds a little strange to speakers who are used to speaking the standard register. So mm -hmm. that's how Mumbai Hindi works. Yeah. Is that something that you hear on the street or is that something that you hear on TV or in movies or No no in street no no we hear it uh, on the streets we hear it it is the hindi that people speak here which is a translation from marathi Right So uh in movies if you have uh, street rowdies or uh, mm. movie set with the underworld and the police so the kind of hindi they speak there is mumbai hindi oh. God. That is usually how it's depicted in the media. Oh my God, Mumbai Hindi, how interesting! Oh yes, you definitely should have a look at it later on. <laughs> Some very very peculiar words and phrases. I love this, and and you know why I asked that question too because I know that in cities, the we have an urban we have an urban way of communicating with each other. Yes, and yes, it changes from. You know, if you're in New York, if you're in London, if you're in Tokyo, in Mumbai, there's always something that comes together and arises out of, you know, either it's coming from young people, or yes. it's coming from just that mix of culture and that mix of languages that's there. So, I never would have even thought <laughs> about Mumbai Hindi, and this is so cool. In Marathi, how? Oh my gosh, how do I want to ask this? Like, because now I'm wondering about how younger people talk. And I know that saying that makes me sound ancient, but <laughs> 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 but I'm wondering, you know, you know what younger people can do with words and how they oh, can, what they can do with language. So now I'm wondering, like, are they doing anything like different with marathi are they expressing themselves kind of in a non standard way have you noticed anything uh no not not really because uh, i'll tell you because the way uh, me and my my peers talk so we we'll, of course there there's a lot of english mixed into it so if if i'm talking in three sentences one half of the sentence is going to be in marathi the other half in english or with some english words mixed in the middle or there'll be some hindi hindi words so like i said again over there in the conversation it's an entire melting pot yeah. so of so of course literary marathi is of course different we don't speak like the way we we write because right. that is a very formal register mm -hmm. but uh, yeah i mean honestly i don't have a, a specific answer to that because it is so scattered it is so wide there is so much of influence that there is not one specific thing Yeah. There is a lot of stuff happening there. Yeah. Which yeah. So exciting. That's so exciting, Uma. Translation. Tell us about your path to translation. Tell us about where you started and some of your influences and and what what excites you about translation. Oh, thanks for this question. I was wondering <laughs> uh, when you would ask it because it's a topic that I really enjoy talking about. and uh, talking about translation so i think uh, i've always had a flair for languages uh, ever since i was a kid 
So I realized that I didn't have to make an effort to uh, study languages like English or Hindi or Marathi or even creative writing for that matter in these languages. So I didn't really have to make an effort like I had to do for math and science. So it was just, it was, it would happen effortlessly. And I mm -hmm. loved uh, studying these languages at least. So since, so the love for languages stems right from there. And uh, growing up, I had a very educational environment in my house. There was always, uh, I was being exposed to a lot of different music and films and books and I was always in, in, in encouraged to read because in school, the level of Marathi that was taught at my school was uh, a very basic level. Mm. Like, it, it, it like I wouldn't call it challenging at all. What my parents did was that uh, they brought me supplementary reading to do at, at home. So they started me off with grown-up books. They'd get me these anthologies of short stories. My mom would read them to me and... So that's how I got I got into the habit of reading because there are still uh, many people, as in many youngsters, uh, who cannot read the Devanagari script as fast as they do the English script, the okay. Roman, Roman script. I had that experience from the beginning that I can read the Devanagari and Roman at the same same speed and with equal comfort. I don't mind at all. So that's where it it's, it started from. Over the years, of course. Uh, in my career at many different points in whatever jobs I did, there was always some language, some aspect of language in, in included. So either I had to write something or like translate itineraries or like proofread things or uh, just like there was some, some language and writing was just always there with me at every point in time. And this page happened when... Um, at the end of 2019, I said I want a passion project for 2020. And then uh, I had uh, peers who had their own pages on Instagram. They would write about films and music. So I said, you know, maybe I can do some something similar. So I said, you know, let me try translation. And then 2020, we all know what happened. Yes. <laughs> the world just uh, went to shit. So, uh, <laughs> so that's when uh, I tried my hand at doing a lot more things and even I was learning I mean back then I didn't know much so then even I was just along the way when I was just discovering it and then uh, that page sort of took off which is uh, the reason why we are here talking <laughs> <laughs> after so after so many years and uh, yeah so that's what led me to translation and also, uh, the literary mentorship I received in 2022, it was a mentorship uh, to, uh, I mean, to train under uh, Mr. Arunavas Sinha, who is one of India's foremost literary translators. Hmm. He translates from Bengali to English and English in Bengali. So it was, an, it, it was a chance to be mentored by him along with the cohort. And uh, that kind of changed the game for me because being selected in, in that kind of reaffirm that, uh, okay, I can actually do this. I'm not just winging it or I'm not just bluffing. So it was a sort of a validation. And uh, what I like the most about tran translation is inhabiting different worlds, mm -hmm. inhabiting different linguistic worlds and, and, sp and spaces. Because uh, after so many years, I can say now that the excitement of finding that word or finding that particular phrase for, to express a Marathi concept or some some something about the culture into English that happiness is just unparalleled for me it's just like okay you know wow like I can actually move between these two places yeah and then of course it's not just the words there are a lot of things when you translate you need to take into mind but what makes me happy is just getting the correct word or seeing that finished piece or just reading it or the happiness of sharing my culture with with others. That's the main thing. Yeah. It just makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> the world needs translators because we need to have people like you who truly love to share their culture because that's the best way to understand by someone who embodies their culture and is 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 loving the act of sharing their culture and sharing their language with others. Tell us about some of the things that you have been translating. 
there's a whole bunch of things that I'm uh, doing. I'm working on my first book length translation. It's a collection of short stories, which is it's speculative fiction written in 1940s. So Ooh. those are pretty interesting. And I'm working on a few uh, stories that come under the umbrella of mystery fiction or ghost fiction, horror. So I'm working on a few stories of, of, uh, of that. Yeah, that's about it. The translations I do for my own page, of course. So these little snippets, these songs. So that's happening, of course, on a regular basis because the muscle needs to be exercised. It's just like a muscle. If you're a translator, you need to practice. Mm. So just just keep the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like any other creative. So you just need to put in the work. Exactly. I know that you have a love of cinema and music. So how does that play into your career as a translator? And and what have you been doing with film and music and translation? So I just want to begin by telling you that the person who is considered the father of Indian cinema is Dada Sahib Farfarke. He was a Maharashtrian. He made the he made the first Indian film in 1913. It's called Raja Harish Chandra about an honest and righteous king. So that's a mythological tale from the Mahabharat. And so Dada Sahib Farke kind of put the whole Indian cinema thing rolling. As it's because of him that the cinema in the Indian subcontinent exists and not just Bollywood. So cinema or all, all of it we we, we just owe it all to him that as far was a was a, a Maharashtrian. talking about cinema and music i think having some knowledge i wouldn't say knowledge but having some kind of exposure to cinema and also having an exposure to the music in these languages helps me as a translator because it helps me visualize a lot of things mm-hmm. when i translate i draw references from film and music and tv in my head because if there's a scene, I will connect it with a film I have watched. This is actually, this is a very complex concept to explain because I have a kind of like, like stock scenes. So if it's an old mansion, stone mansion, I will bring to mind this one, the one thing, or if there are characters, or if I read, read names, I, I immediately associate it with, I, I like putting a, a face to a name while reading. So all of these things uh, influences my translation. It, helps me become a better translator. Do you mean like when you're reading something and you can imagine like maybe who would be playing the role? Oh, yes, the... yes, Ex- exactly, exactly. Yeah. I can I can imagine who would be playing the role or, or then if, if they're playing the role, then how would the dialogue sound in their voice? And then it just helps you read between the lines uh, much more efficiently because mm-hmm. as a translator, you need to do that. But then when I have references from films and TV and... Of course, music, uh, it helps me do that better. Do books, get, that. Do books get adapted into film? Um, oh, so often? many, okay. so many, so many. Have you had an instance where you've read the book and then they cast the movie and you're like, why did they cast him? Like, I didn't picture that character looking like him or... <laughs> Why did they cast her? That character is not even what I thought. If you ever had moments like that? I've had moments like that where I've read the okay. book and I'm like, oh, why they use that? I didn't picture that character like that at all. Like, okay. Have you had moments like that? Uh, no, I'm afraid not really because uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'll tell you why. So that's that's because uh, there are some. I mean the movies that have I mean, the movies that have been inspired from from, from books. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, I I got to them much later. So I didn't have the time, not the time, but I didn't really get to read the book and then imagine who would be be, be cast and stuff. But uh, we do have a lot of uh, great cinema that's been ad- adapted from uh, not only novels but also short stories, plays. So there is a lot of that happening. In okay. Mar- not only in Marathi cinema, but in Indian cinema as a whole. Okay. L- l- literature has been a great inspiration for cinema. I mean, of, of course, I mean, not, not, not just as, but just everywhere globally. I would love to know a bit about Marathi films and, you know, what are we, what are we seeing in the movies? Who are we, who are some of our favorite stars or our favorite directors or anything like that? 
where where do I start now? Because this is such a it is such a vast topic. Okay, so uh, Marathi cinema is very known for this is just a this is just an umbrella not not umbrella but just an overview of, I'm I'm giving you. So uh, there are a lot of slice of life stories, a uh, lot of uh, dramatic stories. There is a lot of historicals happening, and uh, there is a lot of experimental films also happening. There are a lot of indie filmmakers exploring a wide variety of topics. So uh, you would have a uh, Paresh Mokashi is a director who directed uh, Harish Chandrachi Factory, which is a biopic on Dada Sai Farke. I just told you about, about the father of Indian cinema. So you are uh, Paresh Mokashi. Then you have Akshay Indekar, who is uh, an indie filmmaker, I think he he does some experimental things like Trija and uh, I'm not sure of his other work, but Trija is the one that I know. Then you have, um, who else is there? Then there's Kedar Shinde who has directed some memorable films as Agabai Arecha and he has just directed a biopic last year about uh, a Marathi poet and balladeer. So these these are just a, f- a few names that I can give you. But uh, if you want if you want film records, I I can definitely I can definitely tell you about some. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Ravi Jadhav is a director who is uh, known for many many critically acclaimed films. So he directed a film called Bala Gandharva. So a Gandharva is a celestial musician in mm-hmm. mythology. So this Bala Gandharva he was a thespian who performed in Maharashtra between uh, 1910 to 1940. And he was responsible for uh, setting the Marathi theatre scene at that time. So those are musical plays, so which used to have upwards of uh, 20, 25 songs, and they would uh, they would last the whole night, night, night long. Ooh. So uh, Marathi theatre has a very rich tradition, and uh, this person was one of the forerunners of that tradition. So when people of so so then obviously when people started to, I mean not not with that sorry but when the advent of film happened so the first talkie in India was made in 1931 it was a film called Alam Arara, so after that then uh, theater uh, Sangeet Nataks which is musical play started to be phased out and that's when uh, that's when films were uh, films were pop were films got popularized and then of course afterwards the theater scene developed but Balagandharva was he was he would dress as a woman and in sasaris and jewelry and sing on stage because that time women were not really encouraged to get into the performing arts mm. so you have that for that film which is a biopic it's a multiple national award winner it has all the original songs from late 19th century you have to have that Wow. Then there was a resurgence in Marathi folk music with the film called Nataranga. So Nataranga is a king of the stage. So which is about, it covers the Marathi folk theater or the Tamasha tradition. So this is a kind of folk dance and folk music, which was, uh, we are given a glimpse into it through the eyes of a stage performer. Now this mm-hmm. is also based on a Marathi novel. So you have such uh, landmark films, which change everything for us that's exciting what i'm thinking is if you have a film that is based on historical you know or a folks a folk story or folk stories or a film that came out a hundred years ago and you're doing it today you're translating it today i imagine there'd be so much consideration that you'd have to take because the language likely evolved over that time so there's a second set of like knowledge that you need to have to understand well not only literally what they're saying but also in the cultural context of a hundred years ago or 50 years ago or something like that have you ever had any instances of translating something from decades ago into now and if you have what kind of process do you have for taking on a, a job like that Okay, uh, so when you talk about translating films, uh, I haven't really done subtitling, but the concept that you're that you're talking about, so taking something which is so old and sort of bringing that into English, into a modern English, that I have def- definitely done when I'm translating literature. There isn't one specific thing that I do. So uh, 
it's all about uh, understanding what the concept is and just just finding the correct terms and getting it into english as as much as you can see again now this is a very it's a very complex concept to uh, explain so uh, what i do is i just try and get the gist of what is uh, being being said and as much as i can i try and retain the original meaning because in translation there's always going to be something that is left behind something that is lost but then see again that is the beauty there is something that's being lost but then there is so much that is being gained uh, of course it really pains me that i can't transfer the marathi exactly i would love my readers to experience any text or any line in marathi the way i did when i first read it but unfortunately i can't do do, do that so the next best thing i can do is translate yeah so that's what i try and do i think that every translator is your processes are all different your processes are you know what you do may not be what the next person does and i i always like to to ask about process because i would love to be a translator i think i would be really good at it just being honest i think i would be a great translator my problem well, you should, is you should you should definitely try i need to learn another language first <laughs> <laughs> i need to become fluent enough in another language to be able to do that um and i'm working on it you know i may get there it's it's definitely a goal that i have um but i always love speaking with translators to understand how they connect to their work and how they go through their process of translating because it's it's such a responsibility right and i think that so many people take it for granted but it really is such a responsibility and a privilege um maybe not privilege is the right word but it's it's an honor i think it's an honor to be able to to translate to translate words and translate culture and especially when you love what you do i think it's such a beautiful thing as far as process goes how do you decide what you want to translate how do you um how do your projects come to you how do you find or how do you go to them how do you decide what you're going to work with oh very interesting question again you're asking a lot of interesting questions that <laughs> really like that <laughs> okay so translation process how do i choose the things i want to translate let me just start by first off saying that one lifetime is not enough because i have too many things that i want to do and i don't think i'm i'll be able to finish it in this lifetime at least but what i do is that of course i need to like the book i need to be able to like it so much that it needs to stay with me all through the translation process mm. because i shouldn't feel a disc i shouldn't feel a disconnect with the text at any point of time like if i'm feeling bored or it's just it it is just not fair to the process that yeah. i shouldn't be feeling bored of right. whatever i'm i'm doing or the text should tire tire me out very very simply i read a text i like it so much i said you know wow i want to translate this that's how it starts <laughs> <laughs> so that's that that's actually really how really how, how it is now of course uh, um now what sells what doesn't that is a conversation for another day but talking about the books i want to do of course there are so many which have a personal it needs to have some kind of personal uh, significance to me like i just don't want to pick up a pick up a book i've never heard of or something that doesn't mean anything to me i need to have a personal connect with that book now be that it should fit into my own narrative or uh, i should just like what is happening mm. that is my main criteria yeah that so makes that's so how, much sense that's how i picked the books you mentioned that in um 2022 there was a boom of translated literature in india yes. what's going on oh so uh what happened was that the international booker prize in 2022 was won by uh, this novel called tomb of sand it was a translation from hindi the hindi original sorry not 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 original so see the, this is how we need to just reframe the i mean we translators we have to reframe the words words we use so uh, the source text uh, I, i i like to call it source text so the source text was a hindi novel called ret samadhi so ret the sand and samadhi samadhi is again that word which has about 10 50 different meanings 
Mm. But Samadhi is a state of being, uh, oh my God, how do I explain this? <laughs> but uh, yes, so Red Samadhi was translated as Tomb of Sand. Red okay. Samadhi was by an author called Geetanjali Shriji. Tomb of Sand was translated by uh, Daisy Rockwell. And uh, they won, they jointly won the uh, International Booker. And it was the first time a novel from any South Asian language or I think even Hindi had been considered for this award. Which was when uh, we just started getting a lot of uh, in interest for l literature from the Indian sub subcontinent slash South Asia. So that's how it all began. I mean, that was, I think, that was the main event that started it all. Can I ask you why you prefer to use source text versus original text? Oh, yes. When I say original, mm -hmm. I'm implying that there is only one. There is only one text that can exist in that language. So when it's say original Marathi, so it's even the English one is original. It's an original work in English. It is translated, but it's still original even in English. It's a whole new book. Oh. So that's why even I have just reframed my vocabulary over the years to not say original, but I say source because that's the source. And then you will have the source Marathi or Hindi or Tamil or Bangla or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the translation in English or Hindi or Malayala because in India also there's a lot of translation happening between Indian languages as well. So calling one thing as the source and one thing as, sorry, calling one thing as original and one thing as translation. I just think it's doing a great disservice to the entire act, which is why I prefer to use a source text. Okay. I wrote that down and I learned something today. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to try to work that into my own vocabulary <laughs> too. <laughs> so in, in this boom of translation, um, where does Marathi fit in? Where does, where does Marathi literature come into this? And I guess maybe what have you been noticing about the demand on Marathi translation in this boom of trans of translated literature in India I would say that I'm seeing a slight uptick in the demand but uh, like I said not as much as either a Hindi or a Tamil or a Malayalam or a Bangla so it is happening really slowly mm. so of course it's not going to happen overnight I mean so the more we talk about it the more people like me talk about our culture or try and take it to a wider set of people is I think the way to go this is just obviously what how I feel. I mean, there could be other ways to do it as well. But it's happening really, really slowly. And these these things need to, I mean, these things will happen slowly to be able to see a change so many years down the line. For now, I'm just happy that people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what matters. As in there's some, some movement should happen. That is yeah. the only thing. Yeah. Well, please let me know about your social media. Tell us, um, you know, you told us a bit about how you started, but let yes. us know um, what you're doing now on social and most importantly, where we can find you on social media. Okay. So uh, my social media is, I have an Instagram account called Lyrically Obscure. It's Lyrically underscore obscure. It has a yellow and red photo of me on the display picture what's coming next for this account i really don't know i'm just trying to post consistently <laughs> um, consistently for starters and just talk about the things that i like talking about without placing too much importance or too much weightage on metrics because i just want to do the i just want to do what i'm there to do without worrying much about all these other things and Honestly, content creation, I've, I've been in that space where I've chased metrics and vanity metrics and all, and all of that. So that's not a very sustainable place to be in because it really it takes a toll on you on your mental health. And yeah. it's not only that. I mean, you have your life to live, <laughs> to live as well. So I'm just taking it e easy and just, just taking it as it comes. Mm -hmm. I always like to say it's a piece of my heart because that's yeah. when it all began for me. And I love your page because it feels Thank like you. a piece of your heart. It feels personal and it feels like Thank it you. comes across very much that you're doing exactly what you love and you're exactly in the place in life where you need to be right now. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. 
I will add a link to your platform in the show notes for this episode so that people who are ready to check you out and ready to dive into Marathi translation <laughs> and literature. Of course, of course. Film, I would love that. Follow you right away. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've I have so enjoyed speaking with you and laughing with you and sharing all of these things um, and learning more about your culture and your language, Uma. Thank you, Ellen. Like, likewise, it's it's very rare to find a host who's so invested in what you have to say. And you've been so enthusiastic all the way. Like, it's really nice that you like learning about different cultures that you want to dive into more than whatever we have just spoken about on this episode. So thank you so much for that. Oh, you are so welcome. And it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And I, listen... I need to go to India. I don't know. Oh, you definitely what. should come here. You will enjoy it. Okay, but but the heat, you have to come in the winter because <laughs> summer is just bad right now. Oh so. my gosh. <laughs> I am so ready to hang out in Mumbai and and oh, I can't wait. Can I ask you some can I ask you a question about food? Oh, uh of course you can, but then I'm not responsible if we go over time <laughs> because there is so much I want to talk about the food. So uh yeah, so just just a small fun fact that I'm a hotel management graduate. So, oh, are you? <laughs> yeah. Oh. So food is something really close to my heart. But yeah, sorry, over to you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, it's what did okay. you want to ask me about the food? Tell me. I want to ask you in in Marathi, um, in Maharashtra, are there specific dishes that are very, very close to the culture? Dishes that people make that maybe you'd only find in this region of India and you know, maybe something famous from this region. Oh, definitely. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick introduction. So uh, Maharashtra, there are, of course, different kinds of regional cuisines in Maharashtra. There isn't just one kind of thing. And it all depends on geographic locations. So the predominant ingredients in those different regional cu cuisines come from what is readily available. So if you're on, if you're on the coast, it will be more rice and fish. Or uh, if it is somewhere on the plains, then you will have... Uh, lots of peanuts or gram flour or whatever is available. Okay. So uh, this is just an, just an example. But one dish I think everyone should have that comes from Maharashtra is ukritse modak. So uh, a modak is, uh, it's shaped like a kind of, if you take an onion, the there's a bulb and there's a tapered dome. So it, it looks like that and... Uh, it's essentially a dumpling. So the cover is made of rice flour and it's stuffed with a mixture of either jaggery and coconut or sugar and coconut. Depending on it, it depends from every home. And uh, it's has like certain spices like uh, cardamom and nutmeg and whatnot added into the filling. And uh, modak is traditionally offered to the Lord Ganpati. Okay. So Ganpati is the elephant head headed god and it is offered as prasad, which is sanctified food or as we call it bhog. So Ukritse Modak is a mainstay during Ganpati celebrations. There's a 10-day festival that happens sometime in either August or September. And uh, Ukritse Modak is, you have to have it. It's, you can't like, you, 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 you can't skip it. It's sacrilege to just skip Modak. So it is, it is a dumpling, of course, but this one, I, as far as I know, you find it only in Maharashtra. It's a, it's it's sweet. Oh, is yeah. It... And then you have like you cut you cut it open, and then it's a very dramatic process. <laughs> so they're steamed in a steamer, and then you open the lid of that steamer, and then there's entire steam coming out. It's like there's a whole air, air of mystery, and then you take <laughs> it out into a bowl, you serve it, and then you cut it open. And then the steam will come out from that little thing and then you drizzle ghee on it and then you eat it and then you have an afternoon nap. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, Ukritse Modak looks very simple, notoriously difficult to make, but delicious. You okay. should try it. You said the magic word cardamom, which is my favorite spice on earth. So oh, nice. if there's cardamom in it, I will definitely try it. Um, oh and, yes, this is the green cardamom. We have a black cardamom also that's used in savory uh, masalas. So, which cardamom do you, you like? Both. 
both okay. <laughs> I don't discriminate. I like them both. <laughs> and it's it's funny because I didn't grow up eating cardamom. It wasn't something that my mom did not know about it. And that's not, I'm not blaming her, but it's just, I didn't grow up being exposed to cardamom. I don't think I had it till I was maybe, I don't know, in my 20s or so, like maybe 25-ish maybe. And I never looked back. I was like, this is what I've been missing my whole life. Anyway, anyway, yes, I do have to try it. And you said it's the size of an onion. Yes, not not the size. So it's like the shape of the an shape. onion. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So size it is about the size of an onion as 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 well. So they are usually like medium size. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you like cardamom, you should wait till you come come to India. You will go mad because the masalas, the spice blends are there is there's a different one in every house. Oh my gosh! Like oh. the same. Like if there's potato made in my house, it will taste dif different in the next ten ten houses. So each house will make it different. <laughs> and each to... house has different spice blends as well, depending on the palates of the people who who stay over there. Yeah. So oh some people gosh. will have more of one spice. Some people have less of one, one spice. Some people will just omit. And then even that masala has regional variations yeah. depending on what's available there. So it's just, a, it's a, I'll just say it's a riot. It's a riot. <laughs> I'm going to have to meet some families in Mumbai so I can try everybody's different masala mix and and get my get my fill if you are away from Mumbai for a while and then you come back and you are starving what is the what is the dish that you crave oh that would have to be varan bhat so varan bhat is a very typical Maharashtrian dish ag again so varan is uh, it's just uh, dal that is lentils they're just steamed mashed and uh, it's a very simple, simple dish. It's just steamed mashed lentils and there is a basic tempering of uh, turmeric or cumin made in ghee and green chilies and that's just poured over it and it's had with steamed rice. Varan Bhat is, it's in the corner of the heart of every Maharashtrian person, mm. if you say. Like that, that would be like ubiquitous dish. Oh, that sounds delightful. I'm, I've definitely got a lot of eating. You to need do. to make a trip to India, really. Yeah. yeah. You're going to love the food. <laughs> I know. I know. So much flavor. <laughs> so much flavor. I'm excited. I'm excited to to experience someday. Um, well, Uma, thank you again for this conversation. And thank you so much again for having me here. It's yeah. been so, so great. It's such a pleasure. I like to end Thank each you. episode on the same question, just to have a little bit of fun. Do you have any jokes, popular sayings, tongue twisters, cool slang words, idioms, words of wisdom, or words of advice in Marathi to share and to teach us? So there's one in Marathi that I really like, and uh, it's called Khayin Tar Tupashi Nahi Tar Upashi, which means that if I eat it, I'll eat it with ghee. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm not going to eat it. Okay. So I can, I can get behind mean, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So it's basically like you want all the good things in life, but then it also like ind it indicates like stubbornness and you don't want to compromise. You want the best things. Mm -hmm. So like if you eat it, you, you eat it with, with ghee, which is of course that ghee is because it's a symbol of prosperity and richness and like if you have have, have ghee, you, it's a symbol of plenty. So yeah. if you have it, you'll have it with ghee. Otherwise, you won't have it. Yeah. So I am definitely sure that a variation of this egg exists in most Indian languages, <laughs> as it does with most of the proverbs in Marathi. But uh, this is one I like. I, I like because ghee on top of anything really works. Please teach me this proverb. I have my pencil in my hand. I'm gonna write it down syllable by syllable phonetically i'll follow after you and then we'll try yes. to put it all together oh so it's kind 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 k-h-a-i-n kind mm -hmm. tar t-a-r tar tupashi t-u-p-a-s-h-i so uh tup in marathi is is ghee uh the marathi word for ghee it is tup 
असो खाईन तर तुपाशी नाही नाही तर आर यू सेइंग एन एफ फॉर नाही नाही तर के आर तर तर ओके तर उपाशी उपाशी सो upashi means to go hung hungry or to to starve or okay that's that's what it means so i have kain tar to pashi nahi nahi yeah tar upashi yeah yes that's <laughs> that's the word lai <laughs> bhari <laughs> my first marathi sentence <laughs> yay also i've i've made a post on this on my account as well i'll send it to you i'll send it to you later on so you can read like the entire thing yeah but yes live live are you amazing <laughs> and i love that proverb too um <laughs> proverbs are just so useful and and speaking of translation i feel like they definitely transcend language and culture because i there's so many i'm sure we have a version of that in english and in many other languages around the world because it's part of the human condition before i let you go just one last question of course tell me <laughs> you're in mumbai and you have been having a conversation with someone for quite some time let's say an hour and a half an hour yes. an hour and a half and you've really enjoyed the conversation you've had so much fun um speaking with this person and now it's time for you to go your separate ways in marathi what is the best way to say goodbye oh so this is interesting so the best way to say goodbye is yeto 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 or yete which means yete is obviously a feminine word the thing is that you don't say some summon by or i'm or, or i'm going you say i'll i'll be back so there is always a there's always like an open ended thing that someone's going to be back this is not not the end yeah well this is not the end uma oh yes so <laughs> so i've always been chided about this that when i'm saying is i'm going so they well, what is going if you say i'm coming yeah <laughs> <laughs> So love- this this is there in in some Hindi films as well that uh, there's you've heard of Shahrukh Khan right you have right of course yeah. so Shahrukh Khan <laughs> so Shahrukh Khan there is a dialogue of his that says that alvida kehne se fir milne ki ummeed mar jati hai so when you say goodbye the the hope or the possibility of meeting again is dies so that the god himself has said it who are we to who are we to object who are we to object to <laughs> shahrukh <Yes>. khan <laughs> <laughs> yes so yes you can say yete 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 uma thank you so much for joining me on this episode and i will be talking to you soon thank you so much it's been a pleasure